like DevOps, it's a bit, it's a bit more complex. Uh, we care for the most, uh, the biggest tools at Google, the biggest sites, or the biggest uh, um, systems. Uh, it's just a very small amount of uh, people. It's a few thousands. So Google has 50,000 uh, and more uh, engineers. And there are some things that we do. We, we are care for things like availability, latency, performance, efficiency. We tend to care about putting things together instead of building things. Uh, we don't take care of uh, features that you will see, like a new compose in email or in Gmail or things like that. We care more about making things reliable. If we fail, you will see New York Times says Google is down. Um, we also do monitoring, which is what I'm going to talk today about. Uh, we do emergency response, so if something fails, my phone will, will actually ring and say, you have five minutes to fix this, or to figure out what's the problem and mitigate the problem. Uh, we also do capacity planning, so figure out how many more data center Google has to build, or things like that. Okay, so let's start. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Oops. My name is Roberto Lupi. I'm a site ability engineer in Zurich, Google Zurich, in uh, production monitoring. I've been at Google for four year, years and a half, both on the monitoring and on the alerting side. So I've been on call for both the, um, all the monitoring systems and all the alerting systems that we have. I think it's a major duty, but on steroids. Uh, Monarch is actually one of the biggest systems we have to do monitoring. It's the current state-of-the-art monitoring system at Google. And naturally, it's not just a small team that does this. There is a, many teams that implement it, uh, and there are multiple SRE teams that are care of it, or at least my team is geographically distributed. Uh, these slides were presented uh, uh, f first by John Banning in the US. This is just the second time we talk about this in the whole world, the first time in Europe. John Banning is the tech lead for the query engine. So this is somewhat different from the talk you've seen so far, uh, at least if you have been in the same talks like me. I'm not trying to sell you anything. This is not, you're not going to come out of this with a new API that you can use. Although, maybe you can come out of this with some idea how to build a, a distributed monitoring system, or more like how to build a distributed real-time database, because at the end, this is what it is. Uh, some background. These are our current data centers. This is, you can go to this link and see them. Actually, we are bringing, building much more. In 2017, we will add 12 different locations just for cloud. Things like Sydney, Australia, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Frankfurt, Germany, Mumbai, India, Singapore, uh, Amina, Finland, uh, North um, Virginia, US, and London. Plus four more than I can talk about yet. Um, so we have to monitor all these things, and it's really, really a huge amount of data. I mean. Do you remember those pictures of all the, our data centers? It's like huge buildings. You can fit several soccer fields, tens of, of soccer fields into them. We have to monitor about 100 million different things in, this thing, in these systems. They generate 10 billion of measurements. Well, 100 millions, not just 100 million. 100 millions of different things. They generate tens of billions of measurements every second. They generate tens of billions of gigabytes per second that we have to ingest to process and to make available in real time. Because if something breaks, you don't want to wait in order to uh, figure out what is broken. And before this, uh, naturally, they're not just computers. I mean, they're not just software. They can be hardware. They can be sensor networks to figure out if our data centers are on fire. They can be black boxes that we use made by third party, maybe for geographical connections or things like that. Um, now, there are big user-facing systems like Gmail. And there are smaller systems like um, maybe the, the one box within search that tells you what is the meta for the next few days. That's maybe one single developer that creates that. And before that, they used to run their own software to do this. It was called Borgman, the most common one. Maybe you heard about that. We published a book about all these things. And uh, there is actually an ex-Googler that went to SoundCloud and with some other guys there created something called Prometheus. It's like stealing the fire from the gods. Although, if you actually remember the story, Zeus got mad at Prometheus for one reason. It only stole the fire, it didn't stole the wisdom. 
And so I'm here to bring you some wisdom about that. Borman is really powerful. It has a very complex language. Uh, it, it's very hard to run if you start the first time. It's a super powerful macro language to configure it. And so the, the real problem there was that you actually need very specialized knowledge to run it. It was like a rite of passage to start in a SRE team, which is the most user of Borgman, and figure out what is your monitoring so that you can actually be on call for it. So smaller teams that are just made of developers had the problem, hey, I have to run these things. How am I going to do it? And then they will just copy and paste some configuration. Then things got airy after a while. So we wanted something simpler. We wanted a service. We wanted something that people can use without a lot of knowledge, but yet can be powerful enough for monitoring something like Gmail or Search or YouTube. And uh, we wanted something that, so in the case of Morgan, if you have something big enough like Search, you have to actually create your own distributed system on top of Morgan to make it work. And we didn't want people to have to do this every time. So we wanted to create a single system, solve this problem once. Um, Now, you remember the global distribution. How do we solve this in a reliable system? How do we make it work for everyone? We actually start small. We start locally. Within one of these data centers, we have a very uh, powerful network. They are very reliable. They are completely redundant. So I can be quite sure that within one of these systems, one of these big groups of data, physical buildings that compose a data center, uh, I will not have too many problems. I can find a path to make things still work. Although this can work also if there are problems in the network temporarily. And within this system, there are a lot of things that are running and we call them targets because they need to be monitored. So we, they are monitor targets for us. Each of these, like I said, can be anything from software. Most of this is software, but it's also hardware. It's also sensors and other things. They talk to Monarch through something called the StreamZ library. This is a set of libraries for different languages, both things that you normally use like C++, Python, Go, and Java, and some more esoteric stuff we use. And um, they basically are used to publish metrics into Monarch, so collection of data. This is the chunk, the, the data, uh, the um, native things within Monarch that you can interrogate. So how does a metric work? It looks like this. It's some kind of thing, so some kind of um, aspect of the thing that I want to monitor. In this case, it's, pro it's an HTTP server, and I want to know what is the response latencies to various requests. And it has a very powerful type system. It's not just int, strings, or, or uh, floats. In this case, it's a distribution. It's actually uh, an histogram plus some summary statistics, so I can do things like give me the 95 percentile of the latency for the request for this cat video uh, across all of YouTube uh, servers. Um, it's not just one. It can have uh, this uh, classification uh, strings. We call them metric fields. In this case, it's the path within the uh, HTTP server and also the status code of the result. So I can see, for example, that maybe some errors return a completely different latency than some other stuff because maybe there is a problem in some of the backends of this system. And then metrics just give me one part. The other part is I need to identify things that emit metrics. We call them targets. And so the most common target is a Borg task, is something that runs on our cluster schedule. It's called Borg. In the case of Borg tasks, they have a string, the user, they have a um, job name. Cell is more or less uh, uh, part within our data center. You can think of it more, like, more or less like a Kubernetes cluster. Just it's a very, very big Kubernetes cluster. And um, a task number is a replica within, the, like the pod within this Kubernetes cluster. There can be other target schema. If you are monitoring top of the rack switches, maybe you uh, actually care about the physical uh, switch where it is. Uh, I mean, the physical rack where the rack is. Uh, if you monitor something else, you care about something else, you can actually define custom schemas within Monarch. And the nice thing is that they actually pr create a, an ordering of targets. If you concatenate the type of uh, target schema with all the values, you get a nice ordering of, of the space of all the targets. So you can actually use this to shard your data across different pieces. Now, we have the target, and we want to get these metrics into Monarch. 
the thing that happens is that the StrangeZ library will contact Monarch on specific part of Monarch is called the ingestion routers. This thing knows what are the configuration within Monarch. The target will tell, hey, I have all these metrics. What do you want? And then just Router will tell it, okay, of this 1,000 metrics you have, I only need these three or four, maybe these hundreds. And uh, I want this one every second. I want this other one every five minutes. This one, you can send it to me every time it changes or something like that. The ingestion router knows the configuration, knows the target, and also knows what are the pieces into Monarch that will store this information. These are called leaves because they are part of a tree like, like we see in a, in a bit. And each of these will store all the information that can arise from the targets through the ingestion routers. Now, they keep this data in memory in a very compact database. Uh, they also store continuously this data into checkpoints, uh, into recovery files. We call them checkpoints. The idea is that if that leaf gets preempted, or if a machine on which a leaf runs goes down for any reason, or for any other uh, situation, a leaf crash, we can actually restore this data into another leaf. And they are replicated, so we not, don't write on just one leaf, we write on multiple leaves, uh, all the data that arrives. So it's highly improbable that all of the leaves for a specific data point, for a specific target will go down at once. Uh, the recovery logs are also used to store them into a long-term repository, so if they cannot keep all the data in memory, we will serve them from disk later on. The leaves store this data into streams. Now, the streams are basically two parts. One is the stream identifier, which is the target plus the metadata of the metric. So we have something like HTTP, um, uh, response, um, HTTP server response latency plus the Borg target that emitted it. And then we use the values that arise individually from the target and we create a time stream of this, like a time series. This is the way the leaves organize data in memory. This is the way leaves look, this data looks like when you want to query it. It's much like a relational database where you have some stream AD columns that you can use for queries and some time series column that you can use to actually store your data. So you can do things like, okay, look at all the things of user Jones of the job server, all of the cells, give me all of the task number, just the status for code for response of type DB, allocation on the path alloc, and I want the data between now and seven, seven days ago, all the data there. And it's essentially like a, a relational database in terms of, um, of operation that you can do on them. So how queries actually work is very similar. Queries, the, we're still looking at a single data center here. So queries at a single data center will arrive from some other way to the zone mixer. The zone mixer knows on which leave the data is stored, so they can ask, the specific leaf that has this information, hey, give me the, the results of this operation. If the leaves have all the data in memory, they can serve it out of memory. If they don't, they can ask the long-term repository for it. And then the zone mixer returns all the data. Now, we're gonna go a little bit deeper here. But before we do this, there are also ways to set up automatic queries. These are for things like calculate aggregation, essentially, or uh, notification. You can do things like hey, give me the percentile, give me the distribution of, of latencies for all the workers in Gmail. I don't care of the hundreds of thousands of workers that may have in a data center individually. They can go down uh, as much as they, they want. I only care if there is a problem in aggregate there. So I want to strip all the data and just store the aggregate information. Uh, they can also be used for um, um, notifications like sending a page to me or create a bug in a bug system or any kind of action, uh, really. And these are just work just like normal query, just they talk directly to the zone mixer and they run essentially in the same way that a user query would run. They have a specific frequency, so I can say, okay, I want to run this aggregation every second, I want to run this aggregation every hour or whatever. Now, we have a way to monitor each of these things. We have to put all these things together. And the way we integrate these things globally is to a layer that does essentially provide two functions, a way to configure the world system and a way to see the world system as one when I want to query it. So from the user point of view, it's just one big system. Is conceptually a single system, is geographically distributed, but from the actual reliability point of view, it's many different systems that actually work anonymously. Each of them can exist even if the global system goes down. 
and actually it, most of them can also continue to work even if some of the parts of the system goes down. Like zone mixer can continue to work even if some of the leaves are down. Or there are many replicas of all these jobs, so there is no uh, issue there. The configuration is essentially a way to have a constant, uh, have a, a globally consistent uh, um, way to, to say what I have to collect, what I want to keep in memory, how much I want to keep of it. So it's essentially a distributed Paxos database uh, with a lot of read, um, uh, read replication so that it can handle the load of the tens of thousands of workers that, uh, of jobs that, uh, global, uh, that Monarch has. In terms of uh, user query, they go to root mixers, which essentially have the same relationship with the leaves than the zone mixer have. So, uh, well, they have essentially the same relationship with the zone mixer than the zone mixer with the leaf. So a query goes to the root mixer, the root mixer knows to which zone mixer to ask, the zone mixer will ask the leaves. And in a similar way, uh, we do evaluation at the global zone for data that needs to be aggregated globally. We also have a global zone of leaves to store this data. Uh, so we have a monarch zones, we integrate them globally. Now, let's see how I can actually query this in reality, what, what people do to the query this. So typical query looks something like this. Um, this is like a um, specialized notation for it. There are other ways to express the same thing. Uh, it looks like pipes because we are actually processing streams but it behaves mostly like a, a relational database in many in any way. For example, I can do joins, uh, I can do unions, I, I can do selections. In this case, I want to select the table called Borg task, HTTP server response latency, only the user Gmail. I want to group them by a specific job and by the, by the cell. Of this, I want to calculate a 95 percentile and all the data for the last 12 hours. I can do other things like Tell me the ones that have the highest value. So instead of having maybe hundreds of these data points or even thousands in the case if I get group by job, I will have uh, just <coughs> maybe the top five. The, these things, you can actually omit some of this data. Uh, actually, I'm already omitting here some stuff. This is the kind of query I will write in, in our interactive uh, uh, dashboard. And then Monarch will be, the, the, or actually the dashboard will be smart enough to figure out how many points to ask Monarch for it. So it's actually how many, po how many points within this 12 hours is something that is, will be computed by the dashboard to give me exactly one pixel resolution. But if I want to be more concise, I know that, for example, I only use, a, I'm a Gmail SRE, I only care about Gmail, so I, I, don't, I can specify Gmail in my preferences and work task can be automatically implied. So I can actually write it like that. The way it works is that the query arrives to the root mixer, which does some minor optimization, but mostly the size at which level it will be executed. So query comes in, it's actually, we are, we are grouping by job and cell. That means since a cell is always uh, completely contained within a single zone, the root mixer knows that it doesn't have to do anything. It has, can push everything down. And so it will actually push everything down to the zone mixer. Zone mixer analyzes the query again, it knows that the data is probably only, um, I mean, actually, the data is um, contained fully in, within the, um, the uh, cell itself. So each, there won't be streams across multiple cells. So it knows that it will do aggregation and percentile here. Now, the data could actually be in multiple leaves, for example, because each leaf may have different stream or different pieces of uh, time, st time um, intervals. And so the, the leaves themselves will only fetch the data maybe from the repository, will align the data so that even if they collected data at, at different times in a um, different point in time, they, they will be configured to collect the data, for example, every second. But maybe one does it exactly on the second, one does it uh, with some difference between them because there are two different uh, independent systems that are collecting data from multiple tasks, for example. In this case, they will align so that I can actually do the operation, like calculate the percentiles correctly. They will aggregate the data, so I can already pre-aggregate by job and by cell all the tasks. They, maybe a leaf can have data about multiple tasks. And I will push it back to the zone mixer, which will again aggregate to the final level, calculate the percentile, and send the data back. In this case, the root mixer does nothing. It's just 
the pushback, all the streams that come from the different zone mixer for the for all Gmails that run essentially around the world everywhere. So multiple streams will be sent to multiple zones. Okay. Um, wow, I'm going very fast. How do people use this? The easiest way, the most common way, the first thing that, that our engineers will use is Panopticon. It's like a GUI for Monarch. You can use it to create your queries graphically, like here. You can also write code if you want. Uh, it can show things as tables or as graphs. Can also do scatter plots and other things. And you can use it to configure retention policies. So essentially, you can say, I want to you to get this data. Keep it for uh, this data every second. Keep this for 24 hours in memory. Then store it into a long-term repository and keep it for five weeks, and then delete it. So it's actually important to be able to delete it, because the previous system, which was called Dumptrack, actually kept the data forever, uh, applying some downsampling. But we st still had data for our 15 years ago. And no one uses it. Well, someone uses that, not, not many. And so there were better ways to do this. Uh, it can do queries. It can let you configure alerts. It can also let you configure dashboards, consoles, only for Monarch. Um, there is, I mean, now, this is what most of the software engineers will use when they start. But if you actually want something that is maintainable, you want to be able to write code, check it into your um, uh, source code configuration system, run tests on it, um, do continuous integration whenever you make changes and all this kind of stuff. We have a very good co um, source configuration system actually that spans all of Google. So let's say I, I put something for my monitoring within our source configuration system and it uses regex to select some of the streams. Now someone somewhere else in the company decides, okay, I think I, I have a, a way to make all regex much faster within Google. However, there is a small bug in this change, and only 1% of the things only in Monarch that use this particular regex get affected. Our continuous integration system will actually notice this, and it won't be able to make the change. This is the good thing. The, there is also some bad side to this personal story. Sometimes I make some changes. I happen to be the first one that makes a change after someone, let's say, I made some changes in an Haskell compiler. However, my piece that might be is in Python that actually uses some C++ code that uses some specialized code to run on the GPU that has, a, that has been built by another piece of software that has like a parser written in Haskell. Since the Haskell compiler changed, all of this change needs to be recompiled. So I'm now waiting for the Haskell compiler to be recompiled. That only happens to one single uh, software engineer in Google, but sometimes it happens to you. Um, so you can make programs, full programs for your, defining your configurations. OK, no, we don't want updates. <coughs> the nice thing about Monarch is not just this, because it's really it's still hard to do monitoring right. It's still hard to know what to monitor, create alerts. The nice thing about Monarch is that unifies everything. So it enables uh, innovation at the next level, in a sense. For, on top of Monarch, people build custom consoles, that dashboard that spans Monarch and other systems. They build Python-based configuration that are called best practice using the data that the uh, Monarch query representation uh, through Python that we saw in the last slide. We built what, well, here it's called really automatic monitoring. What I call it is zero configuration monitoring. So the idea is if it's a duck, well, if it works like a duck and works like a duck, it's a duck. So if it Basically, if it looks like a, a big table client, then I can show you a, a dashboard for a big table client when you ask for dashboard for this particular job. If it uses spanner, then I can show you a spanner da dashboard. You don't have to create your um, dashboards anymore. We can do it for you automatically. Um, we can do anomaly detection for the wall of Google. That's what I spent almost nine months doing. Uh, you can do cross-company monitoring. This is not available just for Google. It's available for all of Alphabet. Slide definition, so people can define this is what is the service level agreement for our user, and we automatically create alerts based on this, so of all the systems that are involved in this. And then automatic some monitoring of standard stuff, like rollouts of new version and things like that. 
It's also used by you when you use uh, Google Cloud. Uh, Stackdriver is built on top of Monarch. <coughs> well, it was not built on top of Monarch before we acquired it, but then they switched to use Monarch instead of their own systems. Um, essentially, every graph except the billing ones that you see in the cloud, in the cloud uh, developers console are, are built on top of Monarch. You can use it for, um, well, we, we had to make a lot of changes actually to do this because Monarch is available to any single e engineer within Google. So a friend of mine, Yerkley, invented broadly the compression algorithm. And one of the things he did is basically demonstrated the impact that it will have. He went to a vice president and said, hey, look at this data. If we do this, we actually save X percent of the CPU for the whole fleet. Can I do this instead of my current work? Uh, Google is really data driven. So if you have the data, you can go to somewhere, someone very high in your hierarchy and tell them, hey, this makes sense. Let me do this. And they will actually let you do that. It's amazing sometimes. But for external user, we cannot do that. For external user, we have, to, for your data, we have to be very careful. We have to encrypt everything so that only you can access it or someone that is uh, on call for it. But only in these cases, it's very carefully audited and it's very carefully, um, the access uh, control is very careful. So you cannot just go to Cloud Monarch and, hey, give me everything about everyone. It will not work. You will have security on your desk very soon probably before you can leave the actual building. And then we need a different way to name things because Stackdriver actually is not just for cloud, Google Cloud, it actually works for the AWS. So you can use Stackdriver and Monarch to monitor AWS. So we had slightly different ways to name things and uh, slightly better now a data model that is more versatile for that. What we learn in this? Well, for starters, a service is a really good idea. It enabled a lot of uh, innovation and left, uh, it saved a lot of uh, development time that was spent in different ways. For the user, being able to use a system that is ubiquitous and monitor everything made them do much more advanced things that, they weren't make, that didn't make sense before. Like uh, this, for example, Yerkley working on a completely new compression algorithm that will, and figuring out how to, how what it will be the impact for the world Google. It makes it easier to start instead of uh, running your own distributed monitoring system every time you have to run some software. However, on the other side, it also made things much harder for people like me because now we have to be build not a system to monitor just one part, but a system to monitor all of Google. So there are some parts like resource management, user isolation, um, being really robust and uh, reliable that was really hard to at the start. In fact, most of these things are things that we had to automate away because otherwise small team cannot really handle it. So right now all of these things are done automatically. It's still complex. It's, it's not the final solution because distributed monitoring is hard in itself. Aligning data, I mean, as a user, understanding that you have to align data is just uh, for some people uh, hard to grasp how to deal with uh, missing data because maybe you didn't uh, set up your uh, re retention policy correctly, you were only storing this data once and then good luck. Maybe the leaves that store your data goes down because there is a new version of, of the Borglet which is the, the piece of code that actually run uh, on Borg the, the single, on a single machine. Um, and so your machine has been restarted and the leaf has been down. So, uh, there are other things that are not just technical, like getting alert rights. Some teams want to alert on symptoms. Some other teams want to alert uh, on uh, root causes. They get much more noisy, but maybe in their case makes more sense. You don't want search to go down. Um, so one size doesn't fit all. You actually still have to think about monitoring and alerting. The other thing we learn is that it's really important to create a platform because it really makes people creative and make people create the next level, um, innovation at the next level. Like, like I said, if you have different monitoring system, everyone is spending time on building monitoring system. If you have a single monitoring system that is good enough for everyone, everyone spends time building something on the monitoring system. Well, thank you.
which li leaves out about 10 minutes for questions, and I'm happy to answer any question. Yes. Yes. What do you use to monitor the platform itself? So, so the question is, the complexity of the platform is pretty huge. What do you use to monitor the platform? Actually, I, I left so much out. Uh, I'm responsible for more than 200 binaries. You have only so, so like five of them. However, there are so many species that just implement details, so they don't want to bore you with the, the details themselves. Um, we actually use Monarch to monitor Monarch. We have two separate instances that monitor each other. And we, ha we have like many more instances, like Cloud is separate, there are other um, developers is other separate, but all of them basically monitor each other. Any other question? Yes. Uh, yes, it's called Colossus. Uh, at the end, it doesn't. Uh, well, it does for some parts, like the um, checkpoint recovery logs. The repository, the repository itself is another separate system, which is almost as complex as Monarch. And um, if for some of reason, it doesn't use um, um, checkpoint. I mean, doesn't use uh, Colossus itself. Behind the scene, it will be Colossus because of the way it works. But we, it's a separate system that has been. Uh, just for uh, storing uh, time series data. And uh, one thing, we talk about time series, but it's not actually only stuff in the time domain that it can store. It's really a real-time database that can store snapshot of information. I don't know if you know about the monitoring system at um, Facebook or Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft, um, uh, Facebook has a very similar system called, I think, Guerrilla. One of the things they do is they take the time series and they transform them from uh, in the time domain to the uh, symbolic representation, it's called SACS. Uh, the thing is it preserves some of the information about time series and it transforms them into strings. So you can apply string algorithm on it to, for example, hey, there is a problem, we release a new version and suddenly there is a lot of bugs. Let me see if there are re um, time series regarding release of new feature that actually correlate with this one. And I do this by having this string representation and then using trees, like tree to, mm, uh, it's a, a particular data structure to actually figure out what are uh, the correlated time series with that. So the same thing you can do with Monarch. Uh, Microsoft has something called Cypress. Uh, they published a paper like uh, two or three years ago and they do uh, an, a really clever thing. Um, <coughs> they basically take a time series and they split it up into three different representation, maybe now more. Uh, one is um, uh, essentially only the low pass uh, frequencies, like the trends, things like that, so that you can see is this going up, it's going down. Um, they then have another part, which is essentially the maxima and the minima, so they can say is this CPU spiking or not. And they do another part, which is essentially a random uh, projection of this data. You can use a random projection, for example, to figure out if two things are correlated with each other. So you can say, okay, are these two jobs actually antagonistic of each other? If I put them on the same CPU, will they slow each other down because they use the cache in the wrong way? And you can do similar things also with the Monarch itself. So it's not just for time series like data in the time domain, you can do all kinds of things. Anything else? Otherwise, thank you very much for coming. And if you're really excited about this, come and talk to me. We are really looking for new SREs. So come to me and talk. Thank you.